Thank you, Sunil ji, and thank you, Prakash ji, for such a wonderful session. Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening to all of you. Welcome to Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita session. Radhe Radhe, Nitin ji, over to you. Radhe Radhe, thank you, Pallavi ji, and thank you, Prakash ji, for a wonderful session on the topic of Guru. Why do we need a Guru? So, thank you. So, welcome, everyone, to today's edition of Daily Wisdom from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you. Good morning, good evening. Hope you're having a great start to your day. I had a wonderful day. Let's get started with our uh, opening prayers. Um, and then we will get into the topic of our discussion today as well. Bhagavad Gita Ram. All right. The Bhagavad Gita Ram. All right. Let me share my screen. We'll get started. Mm -hmm. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. All right, let yes. me put it in our presentation mode and we'll get started. Yes. We'll get started with our opening prayers. Give me a sec. Guru Brahma, Guru. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwarha, Guru Sakshat Par Brahma, Tasmai Shri Guru Venama, Vasudeva Sutam Devam, Kamsa Chanur Mardanam, Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru So Radhe Radhe, good morning, good evening again to all of you. So let's get started. Just give me a second. So today we will get started directly um, because we have uh, our spiritual cash up segment. So we will not have our regular soul soup, which is the science of mind management that we are doing uh, that series. So we will get started directly uh, with our shloka. We'll take three hands and then get started with our discussion. I'm going to recite it. We'll pick up three hands. Yukta karma phalam tyak. Shanti map noti naishthikim Ayukta kam karena Fale sakto ne badhyate. Let's take three hands. Nadi Rade, Shamji, please go ahead. Yeah, Radhe Rade, thank you so much. Yuktaha karam falam tyaktva shanti map noti nastikim ayukta kamu karena fale sakto ni badhyate. Radhe Radhe. Very nice, thank you. Okay, Radhe Radhe. Aparnaji, Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. Radhe Radhe, everyone. Yukta kamu falam tyaktva. Shanti map no te naishtikim Ayukta kama karena Fale sakto ne badhyate. Nice, thank, thank you. you. Let's take one more hand. Radhi Radhi. Yukta karma falam teatva Shanti map no te naishtikim Ayukta. Tah kaam kaarena Fale sakto ni badhyate Very nice. Thank you, Pallavi ji. So let's get started in this shloka. Uh, okay, Chandra ji, you want to go? Maybe we can take one more hand. Please yeah, go ahead. Chandra ji, Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. Thank you. Radhe Radhe. 
ಪ್ರಾಧಿಪತಿ ಯುಕ್ತ ಕರ್ಮ ಫಲಂ ತಾಂತಿ ಆಪ್ನೋತಿ ನೈಷ್ಠಿಕ ಅಯುಕ್ತ ಕಾಮ ಕಾರೇಣ ಫಲೇ ಸತ್ತೋ ನಿವೃತ್ತಿ ನಿಭದ್ಯತೆ ಅಯುಕ್ತ ಕಾಮ ಕಾರೇಣ ಫಲೇ ಸತ್ತೋ ನಿಭದ್ಯತೆ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ all right thank you chandra ji very much priya ji tomorrow we will get the privilege we have to move quickly we have tons of stuff today lined up including our spiritual catch up segment so let's get started this shloka lord is saying that offering the results of all activities to god i think somebody has a speaker on uh, the karm yogis attain everlasting peace various those who being impelled by their desires they work with a selfish motive become entangled because they are attached to the fruits of their actions this is a shloka we have been talking about so let's get started all right so um you see somebody here now let's see you think he's going to jump or not yes or no okay we'll see never the mind so do you see there is something going on here okay there's a two and there's a bit of a divide two poles here or beams there and then there's a bit of a divide here right fortunately this guy is able to take that leap now what are these planks and what is this divide let's try to understand that so from a this is a divide and from a scriptural standpoint this is the biggest divide one encounters when it comes to taking the knowledge and converting it into wisdom right the theoretical knowledge into wisdom this is the biggest divide and the divide which is one of the most difficult ones to overcome as well like uh, maharaj used to say hum jante to hain mante nahi so for us to take that theoretical knowledge and take that next step of trying to implement it in our day to day lives it's a huge leap and if we can actually take that leap that's the best gift we can give to ourselves as well okay and uh, you can take it's a different the divide between theory and practice knowledge and wisdom in hindi it is called gyan and vigyan okay that's a big one now i picked up an example i came across this uh, stuff on whatsapp courtesy ravi ji so i thought okay let me put it it kind of resonates with this theme as well so who has won the economics nobel prize in economics most number of times does anybody know that okay during 19 from 1969 to 2023 let me put a timeline as well yeah anybody knows that okay never mind i'll give you three options okay us china and japan these are the three countries at play does, does anybody know who is which country has scored the highest when it comes to winning the nobel prizes any guesses yes shyam ji Uh, you need to be unmuted go japan ahead. yes please go ahead japan so shyam ji said japan okay and the answer is absolutely wrong okay it is zero times zero times they have not won it at all okay zero times zero times it's actually us 62 times yes yeah 62 times they have won it now let's look at the irony part of it okay now us owes 600 and 859 billion in debt to china which has won nobel prize zero times in economics and a mind boggling hopping 1.1 trillion to japan okay nevertheless it's it's a very simplistic view of it economics is much more complex than that right dollar being the reserve currency they have a right to print it without causing inflation if india were to print rupees it will cause inflation big time us can do that as long as it is a reserve currency so it's a very simplistic view of it uh, but this is kind of a joke of the century so the point here is the knowledge part of it is truly not implemented for whatever reason if it was truly pure pure economics would dictate that you don't live on steroids you somehow exercise financial or fiscal discipline which is apparently not the case as you can see from these numbers itself let's take a more uh, a practical example that uh, you know which which doesn't entail some complex economics and stuff like that which of the two will you prefer okay now let's say you are supposed to 
have one of your near and dear one who needs to undergo a surgical procedure. So you have two options. On one hand, you have this graduate, but this graduate is not an ordinary graduate. Okay, this is a very smart gold medalist medical graduate. Okay, he knows his stuff and has scored, scored top ranks throughout in his university. So one option is there. And second, you have a surgeon worth 20 years of experience. Which one would you prefer? Shamji, you want to go again and get it right this time? <laughs> Radhe, Radhe, Shamji, please. Radhe, Shamji, give you an opportunity to redeem yourself. Thank you so much. Yeah, with the Hara one, green one. Experience. The green one. Yeah. yeah, the green, so the, the medal is also, you know, ribbon is green. So can you be a little more specific? Surgeon with experience. Yeah, All right. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we go with experience because there is no substitute for experience at all, right? So theory, theory is fine. But if somebody has an experience, that is what the real deal is. So we'll go with experience. And the experience is basically applied knowledge, which is not the theoretical knowledge, but the applied knowledge. So Raviji, if you have joined, I took the liberty of converting your jo joke that you had sent to me uh, in a form of a slide today. So hope you'll, you'll like it. So yes, there is no substitute for experience. Theory is theory until we have realized it through implementation and uh, assimilated it in, as part of our DNA, it, it's pointless. It is mere information. Einstein had said it, it is only uh, the applied knowledge counts. Rest all is mere information. So there's no substitute for experience at all. And then we need to bridge the gap between theory and practice. And Bhagavad Gita gives us the tool. It is not something to um, you know just listen, feel good about and forget. It is something that we need to mindfully, consciously and systematically imbibe in our day-to-day -day, day lives and take benefit, reap the benefits of this wonderful knowledge um, that is you know laid out to us on a platter by Swamiji. He simplified it so much for us and Maharajji, right? He's given us the gist of the entire scriptures and we are very blessed and fortunate actually to be in a, at this vantage position of being able to not only understand it, but apply it in the laboratory of our lives, our lives as well. So with that said, let's continue. Just give me a sec. Yeah, let's move on. All right, now, Chintu, let's talk about Chintu. Chintu is reading a book. There's a question and he solved the question. Six cutted by six and he got the answer four. So do you see a problem here? Mm-hmm. I mean, you got the answer right. What's the problem here? You got it right, but you have to get right the right way, right? Yeah. Now, if he comes across it, yes, Saji, please go ahead. Oh, Saji ji, can you please raise your hand? Sandhya. Sandhya ji, please go ahead. Yeah, it's the wrong formula. Yeah. So this Worked might have gotten the answer. Yeah. Might have gotten the answer right, but it doesn't matter, right? So the the key thing here is you need a teacher and uh, get the answer the right way. Okay, you may get it occasionally. You may get lucky. It could be a fluke, or it may give you inconsistent results. But then the point is that if you're not doing it the right way, it does not count. So understanding it the right way is very, 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 very important. You cannot. Uh, reiterate the importance of understanding it the right way and that is where Bhagavad Gita the manual for life comes in very handy not just that like um, Swami Vivekananda had said that the the life science needs to be passed from a master to disciple in all in all sciences more so in spiritual science and it has to come through master to disciple which is a teacher and that teacher needs to have two qualifications uh, Shrutri and Brahmanisht so when we come across such a spiritual master and we have a reason to believe, you know, we have come across a red eyes thing, then we should make the most of that opportunity. So we need to understand it the right way because we might be doing things without truly understanding it, right? For example, I'll take a few examples, right? You might be having a predisposition towards helping people or doing good deeds or doing charity, However, if you don't understand the science of work, which Lord Krishna says as uh, talks about in Bhagavad Gita as Buddhi Yoga or Karam Yoga, then you might be building a subtle pride and ego, inflating your ego in that process. So you are doing it. It is a well-directed 
uh, endeavor or well directed uh, um, you know work that you are doing um, but then it's not truly really giving you the benefit spiritual benefit it might be leading you towards transcendent transcendence transcendence but not truly really taking you across the cycle of life and death right because sattvic is also binding so we need to understand it well or for that matter you might be having uh, you know a predisposition towards exercising patriotism some people feel very strongly about it so but if you are doing it at the expense of harboring negative sentiments towards others or other traditions or other belief systems then also it is counterproductive now again the objective is really well directed the intention is well directed but the result is still not what you are trying to get right or, or for that matter um you might be uh, looking at people to inspire yourself but end up getting envious because you don't understand the deeper secret about the power of thoughts the kind of sentiments to harbor around people for it so it's not just about doing it uh, or getting the answer right but to get it right uh, in the right way by understanding the deeper divine principles that govern it is very 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 important so that is what we were talking about like we spoke about peace yesterday that it is a battle that we are fighting within ourselves okay not something on the external and uh, jagat chittem kain was the question that shankaracharya was asked that who is who is going to conquer the world and he said manohi and the one who conquers the mind can truly conquer the world okay and what are these in, inner demons anger now anger can come it could be directed at people who do not uh, um, fulfill what we are looking for or uh, pose some kind of an impediment to our desires or it could come uh, you know animosity and those kind of emotions can come as well even when our in emotions are well directed like i said patriotism if you are doing it with a sentiment of hatred then it could be very counterproductive in fact our scriptures tell us that the one of the sure shot way of repeating in a tradition is to start hating it and what god will do is he is going to make you repeat in that tradition right there was a great story of a guy in power of thoughts that swami ji has written that this guy was a christian and he did his life regression and he came to know that uh, uh, he 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 used to be a muslim in his previous life and used to hate christians and god made him put him in christian tradition in this life and guess what in this life he was hating jews so we know what will happen in his next life right so the whole objective of uh, you know human life is not to hate others because you will repeat in that tradition as well and there are stories where people have repeated like uh, uh, in certain traditions they do that um, maybe because they had some kind of a predisposition a a anger or bitterness towards other traditions so that's not the idea so anger can come that is an inner demon that we need to really fight with and anger is called the general of maya supreme commander of maya okay everybody has it on the tip of their nose uh some might have it a little deeper but anger is something we need to systematically uh, conquer lust is there it can manifest in a lot of ways uh, in form of uh, not just the sensual desires but also in form of craving for material things fame position power and things like that greed is there where how much is enough we never know right get greed is always there we always keep on shifting our goal post even though what we have might far exceed what you had hoped for when we were young right Uh, but we keep on shifting the goalpost because greed is like that it is like putting fuel to fire and we are never convinced uh, or satisfied or content that now we have had enough it, it just continues there's a beautiful story leo tolstoy's story the charbi ka zameen there is a guy he was told that go around keep running throughout the day and however much land you can cover belongs to you and this guy goes bonkers runs throughout the day you know and tries to cover as much land as he possibly can until he tires himself and finally dies and finally when he dies all that was needed was four yards char bigas i mean was uh, all that he needed towards that it's a very uh, a very thoughtful story but uh, epitomizes human greed which is never satiated it continues forever hatred again this is a sentiment we need to be very very and cautious of because it is dwesh uh, it can come in a lot, a lot of forms and when we hate something we are actually meditating on that thing and we are imbibing that negative quality and it is like drinking that poison uh, which which corrodes the vessel that holds it more than the person to whom it is directed at so this is a very very poisonous 
sentiment we can harbor against anything or anyone. And envy, of course. Envy is something we need to be cautious about. Um, it is said that there are different possibilities, right? Where you are in your life, there could be people who are ahead of you. So instead of becoming envious, we should, you know, derive inspiration from them. And then people who are behind you, then we should be compassionate to them. People who are at the same even keel as you, uh, we should be uh, friendly to them. And people who harbor animosity towards you or bitterness towards you, we should be neutral to them. So this is the way to go about it rather than being envious about people who might be a little ahead of you materially or otherwise. Yes, uh, uh, Pallavi ji. Uh, Nathan ji, Neha ji has asked a related question. Mm -hmm. What happens if a person is born Christian and hate being a Christian? Will he repeat taking birth as a Christian? Hate being a Christian. Huh? Okay. I don't know. That's an interesting one. Um, I don't know. So the whole idea is being uh, learn the lessons that you need to. Right? We don't know what kind of lesson God will create for you. Um, if you hate being a Christian, maybe he'll make you repeat that because there's a reason why you are born in a particular tradition, right? To learn the lessons that you need to. So the idea is to rise above these dualities, rag and dwesh, in the material world. And if in the process, if we end up creating a lesson for ourselves, it's up to God to make us repeat that lesson, right? It could be in form of repeating as a Christian or maybe born in situation circumstances, which God thinks might be better lessons for you to, uh, you know, crack in your next life. So it's very difficult. Um, there's no formula as such that if this, then this, if this, then this. It's just a broader framework or a guideline to suggest that human life is not to be wasted in, um, mm -hmm. in contemplating upon uh, unnecessary contemplation uh, you know, or bitterness or harboring bitterness towards uh, particular sect tradition and people around. But yeah, that is the whole idea. Uh, hatred in general is not a good good sentiment to harbor uh, against anything or anyone. And then, see, hating the situation or circumstance that you are in is indirectly telling God, I don't trust your decision. I know what was better for me. Right? And what the situation that you have put me in or subject uh, me to is something it is uh, unacceptable to me. It is dishonoring God's decision as well. So rather than having some kind of a dis dissatisfaction about our situation, we should simply have acceptance around it, try to make the most of that opportunity, which is uh, spiritual growth for any human being anyways. So with that said, so this battle for peace is what we spoke about yesterday. Global peace, we have spoken about it. Peace by peace, we need to do that. And then the reason for that is we have our back towards God. Now God is kind enough to flip position for us so that our back, that equation is corrected. So we need to turn our, you know, we need to be facing God to correct this. Now let's understand this a little bit more. Now we go to school and we crack exams there, right? And uh, Certain rules, exams are given, we get results and grade based on that. And if we fail, we have to repeat that class. And when we are graduate, we come out of the school, then these laws are no longer applicable to us. In fact, we might be given a red carpet welcome, especially if we have done well. I mean, it's pretty ironical, right? When I remember when I used to be in my school, every teacher, every time my mom will go to school, and they'll say everything is fine, but he's a little careless. You know, one thing they will put in, careless. And then I'll have a good... You know, you know what can happen at home after that. But then once you come back, and especially if you're done decently okay in your life, then they will be like the best student. You know, this was person was best student. We always knew that, right? But anyways, once you have cracked all the exams, you're out of the school, you become a graduate, then uh, the, you know, you you can, uh, the students sits on the school as a faculty member, they can come back as a faculty member. They, they are no longer obligated to write exams or get grades at that point. They're, they're past that stage. And then you can, they can even enjoy the amenities in the staff launch that can happen. So similarly, if you think about the, you know, the situation that we are in, right? Ramayana says that karma pradhan vishwa rachi rakha jo jas karahi so tas fal chakha. Okay, this is the law of karma stated beautifully in Ramayana. So what it means is God says that if you are on your own, 
and you are not surrendered to me, then I have a rule. I bestow justice. We are playing that justice, justice game with God, which is karma. So, you know, what shall you sow, so shall you reap. That is the game, justice-based game that we are playing with God right now. Why? Because we are not yet surrendered. We have not really cracked the exam. If we go back to the school example, we have still not cracked that exam, exam as yet. And because we have not cracked that exam, we are playing a perfect justice-based game with God. Okay, And God is playing a role of an umpire or a referee. If you go to a soccer field, football, soccer, soccer, okay, football is something else here. Uh, soccer or in cricket, an umpire says out, then it is out. A referee shows red card means you have to go out. You have broken some rule, which is a perfect justice dispensing system uh, in the playing field as well. And that is, and a referee or an umpire can make a mistake. That's why we have third umpire or we take assistance from technology. But in case of this law justice dispensing system, which is called the law of karma, there's no scope for scope of error. Karma never misses its state. It is a perfect system that God has designed and it will always catch up with you. Yeah. Why we are playing that game? So see, either there are three possibilities, even in this world. One is injustice, exploitation. So if you are working and you are not getting the right result, Let's say an employer takes a lot of work from you and he does not give you the salary commensurating with the hard work that you have put in. That is called exploitation, injustice. That is one kind of a relationship. The second one is justice-based, where however much work you do, that much you get paid for. So it is like the harder you work, the more you will get paid for. Or the meritocracy like they're doing in the corporate system these days is promoted. If you are... Uh, an exceptional performer, you'll get better bonuses. So which is called a justice-based system. And then the third one is, so in the in case of God, injustice can be ruled out. It can happen in world, but not in the court of God. Injustice is ruled out. So then it leaves us with the second one, which is perfectly justice-based justice, justice -based system. That is the law of karma, which is we have already established that relationship with God. That is the default relationship all of us have in this material world with God. But then there is a third kind of relationship as well, which is called kripa or mercy or grace-based relationship. Okay, In this, what happens is God is willing to give you grace only when you surrender to him. The rule is changed. Now he's making an exception to the rule, but exception to the rule also follows a rule. And what is the rule? Surrender. Okay, so then he frees you up from sin and gives you the divine energies, bliss, divine love, and you start getting the peace that we have been talking about. This shloka was all about peace. Right? Karam Yogi gets that peace. Why? How does Karam Yogi get that peace? Because... In the process of doing karam yoga, they are purifying themselves. And as the process of purification culminates in the form of surrender. And when the surrender happens, you get grace. And when you get grace, you get peace. So this is how the whole cycle completes. So rather than having that transactional relationships, perfect transactional relationship in the world, it's very difficult to maintain credits and debits, right? You may do more, the other person may do less, or you may do less, the other person may do more. Here in this case, it's perfectly just a space system, okay? Whatever you will sow, so shall you will reap. Law of karma is always perfect. But if you have to move to more towards a mercy-based system, we have to perfect surrender. And how can we perfect surrender? By doing Karam Yoga because it will purify ourselves. And the more we'll purify, the more the spirit of surrender will get closer to the principle of surrender. So this is how the principle works. And then we draw, draw God's grace and this cycle is grown. This would be a good segue to the next segment. I think we're going to talk a little bit about surrender today, I guess so. But before we get into that, any questions on what we have spoken about today? I know we spoke a lot. Maybe we can take a couple of questions before we move to our spiritual cash up segment. No questions and drop silence. A lot to contemplate, chew upon. Shamji, you have to ask something or answer some question that I've not answered. Asked. Yes, Archana ji. Archana ji, please go ahead. Okay. Hi, Radhe Radhe. 
Um, I don't have a question from today, but I have from t- yesterday when uh, Nitin ji, you said that our duty or responsibility is not uh, to improve someone else, but mm-hmm. we need to focus only on our bhakti. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, like the discourses that you are giving, what is the meaning of that then? Because I, I know that you are trying to help everyone around to you know gain that knowledge. Of Bhagavad Gita, and I like to do that as well under my capacity, whatever I can. So, should we not do that, or we should only focus on ourselves? It's a good one. I don't know how I ended up in this. Okay, it's for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more of a, it's a seva, guru seva for me because um, uh, during COVID time, Swamiji said, "Okay, why don't you start doing that?" So I said, "Sure." do that but that does not absolve me from working on myself and making you know doing this okay. uh, uh, solely for the purpose of you know thinking that I own uh, this thing of you know making a difference in people's life or or to work on them not not at all okay my primary mm-hmm. focus is still to work on myself and in the process if I can do seva with the indoor endorsement from our guru itself sure the same thing applies for us as well in, yeah. in our little spheres, whatever bubble we have, whatever sphere of influence we have, sure, we can do that, but we cannot make it the thing in our life. The the thing mm-hmm. or the main focal point for us would should still be improving ourselves. And that is, and when we do that, that increases our odds of increasing our influence around as well, right? Because people look up to you more than what you talk. They really look at look up to you on how you go about it, right? And even in aeroplanes, they say that, right? Put on your oxygen mask before you try to help others. Mm-hmm. The key is, sure, I mean, that yeah. doesn't mean we should not talk about it. I mean, we should take a judicious call around it, but sometimes we go overboard. And that is something yeah. uh, we need to be very or cautious about rather than going overboard and trying to uh, improve somebody else we should focus on improving ourselves but do as best as you can but without making it the the only mission of your life is essentially what the message was got it got it okay thank you i think in the whole process we are improving ourselves by that is the key thing if you're yeah, not improving okay. ourselves and we're thinking our only objective and mission is to improve and fix the rest of okay. the world then we have gotten the equation wrong got it okay yeah thank that was right right radhe Yes, uh, Keshav ji, maybe one more and then I will hand it over to Kash uh, for the next segment. Yes, Keshav ji, Radhe Radhe, please go ahead. Yeah, you both written it, I like it. You are will work hard, no doubt about it. Karma Pradhan, Vishwarachi Rakha, Jojo, Jojas Kari, So, Phal Chakha. So, this is Ramayan and we are talking Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita, Prashottam Krishan says, if you surrender to me, then jo jo tumne kiya hai, karma done by you, you don't need to chak that prasada. Uska mm-hmm. swad chakne ki zoot nahi, chai wo sins hai, chai good karma se, chai bad karma se. I will diminish them Delete Fine. them all from your deed, and then you're free. I'll give you moksha, right? And you will get mukti. So then we don't have to. We have to surrender to Prashottam Krishna. We are talking Bhagavad Gita, Radhe Radhe. Very nice. Thank you, Keshavji. Yes. So what does God do? He burns the stockpile of our entire karmas. Um, thank you, Keshavji, for pointing it out. And that's essentially what happens. Eighteen dot six six is what actually illustrates this concept where he says that the sarva dharmam parityajye maamekam sharanam vraj ahem tuam sarva pape vyo mokshi shami maashacha so that shloka tells okay I'm going to take care of that thank you for pointing it out I think we'll continue on that discussion I don't want to steal cash mm-hmm. on what she's going to speak about so over to you cash for the next segment I'm going to stop share now I have technical difficulties. We can see your screen though. Okay. Thank you. All right. Radhe, Radhe, everybody. Um, and thank you once again for 
this blessed opportunity of bringing you some of Maharaji's teachings. Um, so, did you know that the first automobile was patented in 1886? And at that point, these cars only moved forwards. And it wasn't until 1905 that the reverse gear was adopted in all cars on a commercial basis. And do you know how this capability was achieved? It was by reverse engineering, of course. Ha. Okay, so that brings us to our topic, um, learning to unlearn. And this, we're dipping our toes in the chapter of surrender. Plenty to do with what we just spoke about. Um, so this is episode two. So let's dive in. Um, how did we build up to surrender? We talked about the grace of God last time. And we, we saw this example of a parent who's attempting to get a toddler to wear shoes and go to the park. Um, the parent knows good things are waiting for the toddler, but the toddler has other ideas. He thinks he's in control. He thinks he's, he's capable of taking care of himself and throws a tantrum, ends up getting frustrated. Um, but if the child only aligns with the parent and gives up that control, then the parent can take over and life will be very smooth for the toddler. And we said, does this remind us of anyone? And we find ourselves trying to take control and um, desire outcomes that are not happening. And we forget that God and Guru have our best interests at heart. And um, so the message here was, if we align and surrender to our spiritual parents and we give up control, then they can take over and our life will go very smoothly. Um, and we said, like an operating system, we should try to, in the background, think of this prayer, right? Meri chahi mat karo, main murak agyan. Deri chahi mein prabhu hai, mera kalyan. So we should ask for divine thoughts, actions, intentions to flow through us. So getting into today's topic, swallowing surrender. What do I mean by that? Surrender is such a huge concept. It's wide as is, it is deep. So have you ever heard the term, how, how do you eat an elephant? Because elephants are so big. Well, you eat them one bite at a time. So that's what we're going to do with this concept. We'll, we'll slice and dice it into bite sized pieces. And that's how we'll swallow the concept of surrender. So the stuff we're going to look at is we're talking so much about surrender. So what is the big deal with it? Anyway, it is the final frontier. So if we can get to do this, then we don't need to do anything else. That's what our goals and this philosophy tells us. That's all, that's all okay. But what even is surrender? And then we'll also look at what is it not? And then what do I get by surrendering? Why should I do this? Well, it gets me everything I could wish for and more, things I don't even know I want. So what does it take to surrender? As always, it just takes a little bit of self-effort or a lot, we don't know, but we'll see what that entails. And then we'll look at what exactly should be surrendered. What, what does that mean? And we'll see what is that one very specific thing that God is looking for. And so what are the steps involved in surrendering? We'll look at that eventually too. It's not the flick of a switch. We can't just say surrender and it's done. There's some six principles involved and we'll look at it at a uh, further point in time. And then how do I know how much I've surrendered if it's not the flick of a switch? Well, it is possible to gauge this. Our gurus have given us a way to see for ourselves how we're doing on this um, concept. So we'll get into it. We'll, we'll um, slice and dice this. Today, we're just dipping our toes. That's all. Uh, reviews are in. So let's say you have a brand new swanky restaurant in town. What induces you to try it out? Some of us don't want to be guinea pigs and go to a place uh, that no one's been to. We don't know what it's like, right? We're averse to trying out anything new. So you probably read some reviews, right? If the reviews are good, you're seeing, you know, four more stars, five stars, then you'd be like, oh, I gotta go check this out. I wanna try this out. 
So at this stage, we are relying on other people's experience um, so that we can make this attempt, right? We don't have direct personal experience yet, but we will get it once we attempt it, once we try it out. Agreed? So you want to talk about why surrender is such a big deal? Well, Maharajji provides five-star reviews from our five-star scriptures. And in typical Maharajji style, he goes to a lot of them and he'll, he'll, he'll do this flanking concept that we talked about yesterday. From all sides, he'll tell you why surrender is so important. So first he goes to um, the Shvetashwar Upanishad. Um, so he says, surrender to the Supreme Lord, who is the creator of even Brahma and other celestial gods, and by whose grace the soul and intellect are illumined. Then he goes to the Bhagavad Gita. We just talked about it. Um, he says, Arjun, surrender to the Supreme Lord alone with all your being. Then you will receive his grace by which you will attain the divine abode and everlasting peace. Again, he goes to the Bhagavad Gita. This external divine power of mind called Maya, consisting of three modes, can only be crossed by one who surrenders to me. Then he goes to the Bhagavatam. Uh, oh, the, abandon all actions governed by the three modes of Maya and surrender completely unto me, because I am the soul of all souls, the supreme soul. Only then you can become fearless and cross the ocean of Maya. And then he also goes to the Ramayana. It is only through complete surrender that one can attain grace and be liberated from the bondage of Maya. So what is the takeaway from here? Do we see the words complete surrender? Surrender completely unto me. One who surrenders unto me with all your being. So he's trying to really hammer it in. It's not partial. It's not I surrender today and not tomorrow. I surrender a little bit and not everything. It's all or nothing um, to get what we actually want. And the takeaway here is the moment we achieve 100% surrender, that's when you get that grace. That's when you get the divine bliss. That's when you get that everlasting peace. And that's the only way you can cross Maya. So really, that, that's, that's what um, Maharaji is trying to drill into us with all these different five-star reviews. So let's start scratching the surface of surrender, right? What isn't surrender? Let's, let's start a look at that. So Maharaji says, it is not an act. It's not something that you have to do. It's not something that you have to perform. It is not even something that you say with your mouth. It's not a proclamation that says, I've surrendered. Or it's not a bunch of mantras we can chant. It is certainly not a worldly transaction, he says. Because he explains, what does God need or want that you can give him? He is divine and everything that we possess or everything that we can possibly offer offer to him is worldly. It's material. So it's not even a balanced give and take. So don't ever think that it's a worldly transaction where you say, here, God, I give you my surrender and you give me your grace. It's incompatible that way. So then what is surrender if it's not these things? Our gurus tell us it is a state of consciousness. It is a state of being. And it means actually coming to a state of doing nothing. That's very interesting. It means coming to a state of doing nothing. So let's look at what that means. How can you ask me to do something to surrender, but you're saying do nothing? So um, Maharaji has an excellent analogy of a mother and a newborn baby. So imagine this mother who's just had a baby, right? Um, let's Let's look at the legend. The blue part will show you the mother's portion of doership, percentage of doership. And the yellow part will show you the child's percentage of doership. So when this baby is just an itty bitty tiny thing, it's completely helpless, right? What can it do for itself? His mother is taking care of every single thing. So 100% of the doership falls on the mom's shoulders, right? A few months later, when this baby's, uh, you know, just growing up to be pre-toddler stage, starting to be probably peck at his food on his own, um, probably crawling here and there. So mom is probably letting that baby take care of a few things that he can, 
putting him in the baby chair, high chair, and letting him eat. So she gives up a little portion of that doership to that child. Now this child is growing up to become a preschooler, say. So maybe now he's potty trained. Maybe now he's able to bathe himself. So she's given up that portion of stuff too. That is the doership on the child's part now. And the mom is doing that much less for that child, right? And so the story continues. So when this child is in school, he started to do more stuff for himself. He's tying his own shoes, dressing himself. You know, he could be serving himself a snack here and there. So again, proportionately, mom is doing fewer things for that child, age-appropriate help. And this goes on. When the child is in high school, he's taking more and more care. He's probably commuting to school by himself. Mom doesn't have to take care of that part. And then when the child is in college or just starts to work, maybe mom's portion of the task is just bank account. Mom, can I have some money? Maybe that's that's what it's relegated to. And then when this child of hers is a grown man with, say, a job of his own and a family and you know, life of his own, at that point, he doesn't really need anything from mom, per se. He doesn't need mom to do anything for him other than moral support. Um, so you see what's happening over here? We started off being completely dependent and helpless. And we went to a state of being completely independent and in, seemingly in control of what we're doing. So what Maharaj is trying to tell us is, as long as a newborn baby does nothing, the mother does everything for it. When the child starts doing something, the mother lessens her responsibilities to that same extent. When the child begins to do everything, then the mother does nothing. This example fully explains what surrender is. So intuitively, you've probably guessed what we need to do is reverse this and unlearn this and start to give up some of that control and go back to the state. So, you know, I immediately thought of, this is going to seem like such a tangent, but immediately thought of, um, this creature called the immortal jellyfish. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. I promise you I'm not making this up. The immortal jellyfish is the Earth's longest living animal. And what makes it so? You only find it's a, it's a tiny little thing, maybe a few millimeters and lives in the deep, deep ocean. This is so interesting. When damaged, it can hit the reset button and it physically reverts to an earlier stage of development. So I'm not getting into the biology of it, we just need to look at three stages. These are those adult jellyfish, right? Let's say something happened, it's growing older and it's damaged or it's dying. It actually reverts back to a ball of cells. It goes back to its earlier stage of development and then it goes back into the life cycle. So given perfect conditions, it will live forever. The only way these creatures die is because even the deep ocean is a dukkale. Someone preys on them. Someone eats them. So that's how they die. So this is an analogy just to say the immortal jellyfish is able to go back to that helpless childlike state when damaged, right? Now, we don't, obviously, we don't have to do this physically. We can't go back to being babies, but it's a state of being. So our gurus are telling us in our damaged condition state that we are after countless lifetimes, we need to learn to unlearn our ego-driven ways and reverse engineer ourselves to that Nirashit state before God so that we can surrender. So that's really the takeaway for today is um, to, to imbibe the fact that we try to take control and um, we think we are steering our lives, but God actually wants us to relinquish that doership. And going forward, we'll look step by step at what that entails. But for today, um, let's look at our Guru's philosophy that kind of summarizes this. The Vedic perspective of surrender is rooted in the beautiful concept of seeking refuge in God and Guru, that is Samarpan or Sharnagati. It suggests that one willingly submits to the will of God and Guru with total dependence upon his grace. Surrender is a state of consciousness where the body, mind, intellect, and senses of knowledge and perception are submitted to God. The Sharnagati is founded on deep faith and belief that God and Guru have only our best interest at heart 
and will guide us toward that goal in a way that they deem to be the best. There is no desire to rely upon one's knowledge, wealth, social status, strength, and ability to navigate difficulties in life. So, um, practice for you know upcoming week. We see, saw this image of mother and child doership. 100% samarpan at our stage may be difficult, but why not start with samarpan? And I will leave you with one thought. So how is surrender possible? If we think the answer is depending on God, well, the answer is by depending on God. And with that, we conclude today's segment of our dipping our toes in the concept of surrender. Thank you for your patience and attention. Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe, wonderful cash. If that was dipping in toes, I think you took us for a bit of a swim all the way to the jellyfish, you know, the deep waters of jellyfish, adult jellyfish. So fantastic illustrations, uh, especially that... Uh, concept of baby's reliance on mother as it continues to grow old and i could see good dude nodding her head throughout okay 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 this day is going to come very beautiful illustration i think this is the first time i've seen that although i've come across this concept multiple times i loved it i would encourage you to fill out the feedback tracker feedback tracker is not just to give feedback but also to you know just point out maybe one or two nuggets that resonated with you in today's session that would help us to improvise uh, incorporate more of that and embellish our sessions uh, accordingly. So please do fill it out and let's hear uh, some remarks from our participants or any questions that you may have on this concept that we have barely tilled the ground on. Right? Again, a very power-packed presentation. Thank you for that, Cash. Let's hear from some of our participants on this before we move on to our next segment. By the way, before we get into that, quick announcements. Do register for Bhakti Kirtan Retreat. If you have not already, you need to register for it in person or virtual it's available as well it's a fantastic opportunity that you don't want to miss out on let's put in the link in our chat and publish it on our cic groups as well so that everybody can do that uh, all of us can benefit from it you know remotely or in person so please do that that's one announcement i wanted to make but let's hear from our participants and take our discussion forward thank you nathan ji sri ramya ji radhe radhe please sri ramya Shiramya is one of the biggest cheerleaders. Yes, go ahead, Shiramya. <laughs> uh, Radhe Radhe, sorry, Nitinji, I couldn't attend the class for the last two days, but today I saw cash up segment and then I just woke up as like, I'm going to attend no matter what. <laughs> and uh, as usual, an amazing uh, presentation by cash uh, But uh, this time I have a question also. Uh, surrender is not an act, but we need to do take actions to surrender, right? I mean, uh, like without the sadhana or uh, taking time or putting effort, is it possible to surrender without actions? No. I thought, okay. like, uh, yeah, I mean, usually when I act as I do the work and then finally I just say, God, I don't know how this has to be surrendered to you, but take it the way you want it. That's what I tell when I get some work done at the office or something or my, one of my course gets done. So I'm not able to connect how to surrender my work to God. Uh, we'll look at that. We'll look at that. There's absolutely self-effort required to reach that stage of doing nothing. It's counterintuitive, but we'll look at that. That's coming. Okay, okay. Thank you. So amazing presentation, like always. Kashi Ji, you have from Kash, you become Kashi, okay? Which is a holy city mm -hmm. name. <laughs> yes, surrender is the state of doing nothing, but in order to reach the state of doing nothing, we have to do a lot of things. Okay, so... Is act by act, we can get to that uh, stage, but um, definitely there's an effort required for us to do that because we have to unlearn a lot. That reverse gear that we spoke about, uh, that takes a bit of an effort and exertion and letting go of stuff and have more acceptance around that situation. Maybe we can post some scenarios. How do we practice surrender? That would help um, drill this concept a little more deeper. Let's take a few more hands as we can see quite a few hands, in fact. Yes. Uh, maybe we can skip our devotional segment if you want to take all the hands, a minute each for each one of you. Please go ahead. Yes, Sandhya ji, please go ahead. Radhi Radhi. So first of all, I loved your punches, like especially towards the end, uh, which okay. one was like some arpan versus some arpan, as well as this other one, um, which was depending on God by depending on God. So they were like really, really strong and impactful. Uh, questions. 
so one of the question was regarding uh, karm yog uh, so in karm yog we say right uh, inaction is strongly condemned by god so one point was to just clarify that when we reach at the state of doing nothing it is not equivalent to inaction uh, so that's one thing and uh, like i know of course you don't mean it but i thought it is important for us to clarify that and second question was around uh, extent of surrender so i thought uh, as our extent of surrender keeps increasing the grace we end up realizing or utilizing keeps increasing but the special grace the final thing comes only when we get the 100% surrender so if yep. i'm right just confirm that yeah i'm not cool <laughs> thanks yep that final grace that leads to burning of the stockpile of all of our karmas it happens at the 100% surrender as well and god will manifest only at that point so it doesn't that okay i'm 90% surrender so lord krishna can i see you until waste or maybe it will be all or none zero or one at that point yeah but good questions we'll tackle i think in subsequent sessions just go ahead uh, let's take the remaining hands yeah nitin ji there a lot of appreciation and uh, accolades uh, pouring in in the chat so chat is also enabled for all of uh, for everyone so they they can also uh, put their comments and feedback about the presentation in the chat as well yeah people loved the reverse engineering samarpan some arpan jellyfish was something new i learned as well yeah jellyfish was yeah. Uh, definitely yeah uh, thank you for waiting uh, samiran ji please go ahead uh, radhe radhe uh, great presentation as always i just have a question for uh, around surrender like uh, first of all the unlearn thing uh, when i relate to unlearning things i relate it quite often to skills like uh, like as she hostel she, she dances but uh, when a true teacher or guru uh, who is who has mastered the art of dancing uh if he teaches then we actually get to contemplate or things what we have been doing wrong so for so long and we get to get to learn the right techniques and uh, also can you give us some nugget like right now there is a also struggle of giving up on the thought of result right like, uh, like lord krishna says leave all the results on me uh, and don't uh, get attached to the results so we uh, i'm Little bit struggling with that, so this is a whole new concept of uh, okay, surrender. So, little bit of nuggets or tools if you can give to look upon and always keep it handy. We talk about practical tips for practicing surrender. Yeah, yeah. like just by like you said in the slides also, right? Just by telling that okay, I'm surrender, that is not going to do the job by right? itself. So, what are the actual uh, few tools that we can everyone can practice it on a daily basis you want to take this question now or wait for the next session where you might be talking about those okay so wait yeah. it let's build a bit of a suspense for the coming sessions where we will talk about practical tools as well there there's one you can start doing right one is to have that intent of 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 desiring according to what god gives you anyway so aligning will we've talked about that in previous sessions so that's one part of it you can already start doing yeah, one tool like i would tell you to do that in addition to what cash said is prasad buddhi prasad buddhi means when you go to temple pandit ji gives you prasad you don't say that okay give me orange and not banana okay because that's my favorite fruit you simply accept whatever he gives so similarly whatever comes your way in life whatever result you get after putting in your best efforts you have acceptance when you start complaining you have already violated surrender so prasad buddhi acceptance around situations around us is a good one to start off with but we'll talk more about it i'm sure kash will bring in pretty interesting perspectives around oh, just one one last thing that mm -hmm. uh, doesn't surrender also uh, is like surrendering or our actions also not this result how can we uh, not surrendering our actions we still have to do our actions but the doership part of it and acceptance on the results is what true surrender is it doesn't mean you don't do any action at all you still have to do actions inaction is not an option okay 
Yes, Prakash ji. Let's take the videos first and then we'll move to the hands. Yes, Prakash ji, Radhe Radhe. And beautiful presentation. Uh, Kash ji, thank you so much for giving us all these things, short and sweet, uh, with power pack punches, right? Um, so two questions. Uh, first question is, and the mother-child example, um, well, the child is growing, but mother still says the same. Exactly. <laughs> so, just a joke support. So, the, the, the main question is that, uh, I think it just might be similar to what Sanjayji has asked, okay? But I heard, I mean, I kind of read it in Swamiji's uh, lectures that, so the surrender depends on them, the, the grace depends on the amount of surrender that you have. Like, if you surrender 20%, then God will give 20% grace. Um, like that, right? So it's directly proportional to that. But you said like it's all or nothing, right? So I mean, I understand the intricacies. Like, you no, know, as you grow along, I mean, yes, there will be some kind of you no know, plus to God's response. But is there anything inner meaning in it? Like all or nothing? Divine bliss. You'll get that once you completely surrender. Okay. You keep getting grace incrementally, but yeah, you can add. So yeah, the divine, yeah, so all or nothing is the final thing, right? It's like when you have perfected your surrender, that's only when Krishna is going to burn off your stockpile of karmas. Until then, even if you're 99.9% .9 there, you're not secure. It's not like 99.9% .9 karmas are burnt. That happens in one shot towards the end only. And also the darshans of God, right? If it were to happen, would happen only when you have perfected your surrender. Even if you are 0 0.000001 short, it will not happen. So that special grace would come in then, but proportion to the level of your surrender, you will continue to draw grace. That is the principle uh, that follows us. But that special grace, which will take care of your, you know, taking you across that, this ocean, Bhavasagar, Bhavatavi, is going to happen only when you perfect your surrender. And not even, you know, even if you are iota short of it. That's how it works, at least how I've understood from Swamiji's lectures. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jinji and Kash. Shamji, you wanted to say something before we move to Pratusha? Yes. We'll take three, real quick three hands, 10, five. One Thank minute. you so much. Yeah. There's one thing which uh, I can say that this is what I explained in my life. Initially, in my personal life, I was I was trying to do all things myself. But since I joined this Gita classes from 21, I just surrendered to God. And trust you me, things fell in place the way they have wanted to be. I was trying for the last 10 years. I could not do it. And the day I just gave it up, one year and my life changed upside down once again. All set up. And one thing which I like about the analogy is that uh, to be a bacha again. And I don't feel myself going ever, ever. I just behave like a kid. And I just like it that be a kid and things will be with you. That's for sure. I am a life example in front of you. Just be a child and he knows very well what is well for you what is good for you you need it you don't need it he will give it to you for sure the way he wants to give it to you that's it very nice that's right. so much. be good. a bacha again that's it yes sham sundarji is the bacha of sham sundarji okay this is a nice one okay yes pratisha go ahead please go ahead pratisha ji Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe Palavi ji, Radhe Radhe everyone. Raj ji, thank you for the presentation. Wonderful. Um, actually, before the presentation started, I messaged Palavi ji a question where I was asking um, that if we, uh, when we are small, we are always very, very happy, extremely happy. And we, as we grow, we develop some kind of, you know, some scars or it just comes up. Uh, so again, we are working on this because of divine knowledge. And we go back to that child stage. So uh, how long will this carry on? So your presentation just uh, with the jellyfish, it was just like that. The baby is growing and then coming back, then growing again, coming back until the death comes. And I wonder, is that great? Did you lose Patricia? No, no. I'm just asking, uh, is that grace? Because it has been living working on itself for millions of years probably and then it's because where else can you go you will go back to your childhood and that's what we are also doing right We're taking birth again and again and again 
See that. And will, will, yeah. will this continue till yeah. the samskars is gone? True. It and will. that is going back to child is an analogy to tell that we become nirashrit. The mother is an example. We leave everything to God. Like Draupadi did finally. Okay, God, you only are my protector and my savior. Nirashrit means we don't have Swabal Ashray where we depend on ourselves, we on our money, on our relatives, on people around. We don't seek out security from people around, from our finances, from our own strength and stuff like that. So that is the child analogy. We are completely dependent on God. And when we are, then God is more than happy to take our burden in life, right? There's a story of a woman who would go to Thakurji's temple every day. Krishna's temple mm. every day and one day she forgot to go there. Okay, but she was carrying a big log of woods on top of her head and then she forgot. And then on the way, what happens? The logs fell. Okay, that entire stack mm. fell down. So Krishna thought today she has not come. So she he walks up to her and said, you did not come here today. Can I help you? So she says, can you put the logs back on my head? So that's what she ended up asking. Similarly, we are all too busy carrying our own burden. He's more than happy to carry our burden, but it requires faith and surrender. That is what surrender is, where we are totally dependent on becoming Nirashri. So it takes a while. We don't have that acceptance so easily, right? We don't have that. We want to take control of things. We become anxious. We become worried. We are always thinking of future. So all those things, those sanskars, until we exhaust that, or our surrender will not be perfected. But it's a fascinating discussion. I'm sure we cannot wrap it up in a couple of minutes. We'll continue tomorrow. You, we are going to have a session. We'll talk about Siddhis and we'll talk about some of the questions that could not get addressed today um, as part of this discussion because surrender is a very deep topic. Um, pretty, so one bite at a time, we are trying to eat, a, eat an elephant right now. Like we started off with the slide. I'm sure we cannot eat it uh, in next few minutes. Um, so we will continue to have this discussion tomorrow. We'll talk about one of the other things that can take us away from peace and that is Siddhis. We'll talk about what are the different Siddhis, put Siddhis in perspective, um, especially on the path of spirituality. How do we need to perceive them, look at them? And uh, positive time permitting, we'll continue on our discussion on this surrender, topic of surrender. Put in your questions in the feedback tracker. We will bring it to the session and uh, have Cash respond to those and probably put some answers on our slide as well. So please fill out the feedback tracker, especially if you didn't get an opportunity to talk today. Any last party comments? Maybe one more and then we wrap it up. Pallaviji, yeah. you pick up. Yeah, I have posted the link for the feedback tracker as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Manoranjanji didn't get chance. So if I can take Manoranjanji today. All right, Manoranjanji, Kabirji's Doha is coming, calling. Yes, please go ahead. Tell yeah, absolutely. Out. You hit on the nail. So, Sant Kabir is saying, Lali meri lal ki, jit dekhu us lal, lali dekhan mein gai, ho gai lalam lal kabira, ho gai lalam lal. So, when you develop an inquisitive mind to know the Creator, then the sranagati will automatically happen. You need not go for sranagati. It will be happen automatically. How? You have to just have an inquisitive mind. How do I know God? After learning all the Vedas, if you are say that I have not known anything, then you are a, you are a true sranagati. Thank you. Beautiful. Very nice. Thank you, Naranjanji. Maybe 30 seconds each for Sandhya and Keshavji as well to wrap up our session. I know yeah. it has been a little longer, but let's take hand raised, they must be tiring. Yes, go ahead. Radhe, Radhe. I was just, uh, I got reminded of the analogy Cash D had given in the one of the classes regarding melting of the ice. So I was comparing that with surrender. So you keep surrendering more and more. The heat goes and it starts breaking bond inside, but it is not getting reflected as the final melting of ice. And 100% surrender could be seen as the final melting of the ice. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. Yes, it's a good way to visualize surrender in progress. Sip. Sip concept. Thank you for bringing that. It's Keshabji, real quick. Yes, then... Keshabji, please go ahead. Radhe, Radhe. Pritya Usha's question was awesome, but he mentioned one thing. Millions of lives are years, I don't know. And the answer is 16,000 trillion years we have lived in this life, our soul. 
and so many more yet to come. That is the life of Brahmaji. So we have still, we are still. Oh my gosh. Monica said one thing. What was that? Bud oh, loves Kyatha, Monica, you are listening. Buddhu, Kyatha? Bondu. Bondu. Awesome. So, um, Bondu the previous life me. Ab bhi Bondu hai. Ab Bondu nahi banna, bhai. Amara nitin nitni mehnat kar raha hai. Hum Bondu kyu manenge ab? Ab Bondu nahi banna. To surrender kisko karna hai? Only two things. We need to surrender as per Bhagavad Gita. Main ye man adat sab main buddhim niveshya. Nishishya si main ye baat kurdhvam na sanshya. कोई संशय ही नहीं भाई मन और बुद्धि को अर्पण कर दो मन बुद्धि डन डील केशव जी आपने सस्पेंसी ब्रेक कर दिया यू नो अगले सेशंस का बट इट वाज गुड सो वी विल टॉक आई एम श्योर कैश विल टॉक मोर अबाउट व्हाट नीड्स टू बी सरेंडर्ड एंड हाउ बट ऑलवेज अ प्लेजर टू हियर फ्रॉम यू केशव जी आई नो वी आर ओवर टाइम 10 11 इज अ गुड सेगवे टू रैप अप आवर सेशन थैंक यू अगेन फॉर योर एंथुसियास्टिक पार्टिसिपेशन एंड and making uh, making my day in pers- personally i would say it's a good way to wind down every day so thank you again and thanks for a wonderful presentation cash we'll continue we'll talk about siddhis tomorrow bring in your friends and family we'll talk about siddhis okay we'll talk about mystic powers and stuff like that and much more so radhe radhe good night good day from my side and we'll continue with our bhakti segment tomorrow okay make up for it thank you radhe radhe good night good day everyone thank you thank you nitin ji so much and stay blessed everyone Radhe Radhe. Thank you.